in the scripture. Lord, open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to your word that is read and proclaimed today. May we know your truth and respond in faith. Amen. Our scripture reading is uh, from the gospel according to John, and it's chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And at this point, welcome Bob. Groups of people, even at, at one particular time. 
Uh, but we, before returning to the Father, because he came from the Father, Jesus preached the message while he was here about what was the most important commandment of God. The Old Testament certainly clarified it. Jesus came and lived it. The Apostle Paul and the rest of the Apostles certainly gave even fresh meaning and understanding to it. That is, we should love the Lord our God with every ounce of energy in our being. That's what it says. With all our strength, might, soul, everything that's in us is to love the God. And here's the way God knows we love Him. By the love that we have towards one another. You see, our love to God in this direction really is determined by the kind of love that we have towards those on the horizontal level. John would say it this way. If you say that you love God and have hatred in your heart towards others, the truth is not in you. So the truth is, is I, I am to be as Jesus was, as an example and illustration for me out of Scripture, and personally by living by faith in those principles, I live my life, I try to live my life um, by being loving towards mankind, towards other people. It's easy, Jesus said, to love somebody that's loving, lovable back to you. But what about the folks that are not lovable? What about the folks that that despitefully use you and say all manner of evil against you falsely? What about those people who are just continually on your heels as they were the Apostle Paul, trying to discredit everything about what God had called them to do? Paul lived a life of loving them regards. Jesus loved the Pharisees. Called them names, but he loved them anyway. Why? Because you know what? This flesh, all it knows to do is please itself. But you and I have a spirit man. We house the spirit of God. Know you not that you are the temple of God, the Bible says, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. And how does the Holy Spirit live in us? He lives in us by our trusting Him and living by Christ's teachings. Especially, it's all summed up in loving others as we love ourselves. Jesus lived that to the cross and beyond. He gave this great commandment. He lived this great commandment. And then there was this other thing that he gave before he left this world and went back to heaven. This morning, our, our children's pastor, Bryson Long, shared with this being uh, and focusing on the ascension of Jesus Christ, he shared with our children this morning, he had a big box, and in this big box was something we didn't know what it was, because, because we didn't know what it was, it wasn't our, our thing. But all these kids are, alone, are sitting there, and they're all looking around, wondering what's in the box, and he talks about the ascension of Jesus Christ. And about how dumbfounded the apostles and all the people must have been as they watched Jesus with their mouths <coughs> open as he went up to heaven. And it was at that point that he opened up the box. And what rises is a balloon out of that box. And it continues to rise. That's okay. That's the Spirit of God just come on in. <laughs> and, it, and it just kept rising. And I kept wondering. How's he going to get that thing down? But I didn't see the string that was tied to it. So he had thought about it. But that's exactly what it was. You know, and everybody in the congregation, as well as the children, we're all watching it. And then we're reminded as he reads to us, the same Jesus who left will come back again in a like manner. And he did. Well, not yet, but he will come back in a like manner. So we've been given this great commission. Jesus, before doing that, he tells his disciples, those apostles, and all those other people, I, I probably would say even the people that are about to be the 120 that are going to be waiting in Jerusalem until Pentecost came, even those individuals. And, and, and he said, listen, here's what you need to do. Go into all the world and make disciples. 
teaching them to observe all things, whatever I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of time, age, epoch, is the word. I'm with you. Uh, and he was in spirit. Jesus ascended, went back to the Father. The Bible tells us that now he's seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Those concerns that we have down here with each other, those things that are on our hearts, um, those things that trouble us, those things that, that excite us, Jesus is praying and interceding on our behalf before God. That's not all he's doing. He also said he was preparing a place for us. That when we leave this world, we have an abode with him in heaven. But Jesus, you know, they're, they're told, Jesus said, when you go back and you wait, and you wait for the, <coughs> the promise of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not come, even though Christ was leaving. And while they were there, you know, it's been 40 days uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They spend 10 days and they're in this upper room where they had had Last Supper with Jesus. Precious moment. And, 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 and what's interesting is, is while they're there and they're praying and they're waiting for, for Jesus to bring what he said would come, another one like himself... It's like all of a sudden there appeared as wings and tongues and and these individuals were there it was as a flaming fire fell on them kind of like the Old Testament as, as Isaiah went in the temple and, and, and the angel took the coals and put it on his tongue and he began to proclaim God's goodness and the news of, of God. That's exactly what happened here. Jesus said, you will be witnesses of me. Jesus had been gone. Now ten days the Spirit of God comes. And we know that Passover time, we know that there are extra of millions of people who have descended from everywhere else, provinces locally and far off, as far off as even Egypt, came and they're all in Jerusalem. Now, certainly they made provisions for that journey and for their time there. But then when their time was up, you know, they all planned on going back home. But you know what happened? They didn't all go back home. The scripture records in the book of Acts, and that's where I want us to go this morning, Acts chapter 2. Because this is the, the work that's unfinished. This is what Jesus actually came to give to um, to the world through his death, burial, and resurrection, the Spirit of God, so that we can be witnesses to the end of the world, to the for the end of our time. Now, I'm not talking about um, you know some people have a gift of evangelism; they go out and preach at all these different places, and there are people that come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. But you know, we've been called to be witnesses. We are witnesses, whether we accept that or not. We are witnesses of the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or we are witnesses of our own selfishness. We live before other people, either Jesus or self. Jesus or self. Um, we either live to ourselves or we live um, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that over then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said this also before he left, that you'll receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, right there where they were, in Judea, the surrounding area, Samaria, the places where um, Jews typically would not want to have anything to do with, and the other most parts of the world here on out. Now, here's what's interesting. All of those people are in Jerusalem at this time. They're all there. <laughs> They're all there. But what happens when they hear the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
when Peter and the other apostles, when they share the good news of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God quickens that word, that truth in their ears, and a lot of those folks came to know Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. And many of those people, yes, they did go back into their areas taking the gospel and news of Jesus Christ with them. So I want you to just listen to me as I read what takes place in the second chapter of the book of, of, of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, and let me just read verse, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come up, they were all with one accord in one place. That's, they were all back there in that room, they were waiting, and they were all of one mind, one accord, one purpose, waiting for the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Peter does, after the Spirit of God comes on these people, they then are out there amongst the people, and they have this wonderful opportunity of sharing the good news of Jesus. Now, what the disciples did, the apostles, what Paul did, Peter, John, what they all did, they would all go back to the Jewish people and remind them of their history, remind them of the promises of God, remind them of what God told Abraham, remind them of what God did, gave to Moses to lead his special people, his sanctified, set apart people for his purpose, and the covenant that they made with him that whatever he says will do, unfortunately, that hadn't done. It. And they weren't doing it. They thought they were doing good, but they weren't because they weren't focused on the heart of what the Old Testament said. They were more focused on what they had made it to say and what they had made it to mean. They focused on the external and forgot that God really is focused on what's on the inside of us. Because what's on the inside of us, it will be reflected on the outer. You remember when Moses went up on the mountain and he came down, he had spent time with God. When he came down, there was this kind of glow about him, this show kind of the glory of the Lord. And people could tell that he had been with this God that had been taught. People know there ought to be something in our lives that ought to reflect Jesus Christ by what they've heard in the gospel or what they've or, or what they've read themselves out of the gospel or what they've seen in other people. They ought to be able to see Jesus in our life. Unfortunately, maybe they don't see Jesus like they should always in our lives. Sometimes people just see the worst of us, especially family members. Those are the closest to us. But you know what? We are witnesses. And we do have a purpose for being and for living that has been given to us by God. And so Peter proclaims the good news of the gospel. The Spirit of God is helping these people in their tongues, in their languages, helping them to understand the simplicity of this truth that does set people free. And here's their response. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, bringing it all down to Jesus, they were cut to the heart. <laughs> I mean, it got deep down inside their soul. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now that we've heard this, and we've come to realize, only because of the Spirit of God, that it's true. That we have erred and gone our own way. And our ancestors have done it. What do we do now? Peter says this in verse 38. Repent. And let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. 
as many as the Lord will call. And the Bible tells us that during that period of time while they were proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, that about 3,000 people made the decision. Now, 3,000 sounds like a lot to us. But when you think about 3,000 of maybe 2 million people, it may not be such a big number. But it is something that God intended to use to change the rest of the world. I mean, just by Paul and, and, and Barnabas, or by Paul and Silas alone, when they would go in and they would claim the good news of Jesus Christ, here's what they said. These men have turned the world upside down. Well, they haven't. They've just been the mouthpiece. God had turned the world upside down. And by the way, um, God's still turning the world upside down, folks. When he said, when Jesus said, I will build my church and not even hell, hell will stop it. He meant exactly what it says. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, said that God, that Jesus Christ still walks amongst his church. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the head of the church, which governs and tells the rest of the body what it needs to do. Yeah, he's still doing what he said he would do. He still is. We may not see it, but there's reasons why we may not be seeing it. And it doesn't have anything to do with his part. It has everything to do with our part. Our part. Mostly falling into the same trap that the children of Israel had done for years, centuries, and were doing during the time of Jesus. We're hearing it. <laughs> we're seeing it. But we're not getting it. And because we're not getting it, we're not responding as these people did positively toward it. And the reason they weren't getting it is because they were focused on something totally different. We can't follow God and follow ourselves. We, we can't want to be pleasing to the Lord and do what we want to do, how we think it ought to be done. So Peter preaches. People come to know Jesus Christ. They ask what we do. Verse 38, he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. You see, Jesus had already forgiven them for sin because he's already died. <laughs> That's already been taken care of. At the cross, it was finished. It was finished. Nothing's going to be changed or added to it. It was finished. What God intended, he at the right time brought, and the person of Jesus Christ, his son, Salvation for the whole world, past, present, and future. Problem with gifts are you can reach out and give it to somebody, but until they take it, it's not theirs. It's not theirs. They weren't taking it, and they needed to take it. So I want to tell you out of the scripture this morning, I want us to look. And just what does the body of Christ look like? In the book of Acts, which is, which is the, the growing of the early church, it's the moving away from Judaism, Judaism, and it's the moving towards Christianity. That's what you find in the history of the book of Acts. And let me read to you just exactly what the early church looked like and what the church of the 21st century in America should look like. Because it hadn't changed. And maybe we could identify some of the things that may be wrong with us today as a church. Begin with verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Did those who gladly received his word were baptized? And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Verse 42. And here's what they did. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. 
that is all those who were together, uh, a very saw, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. You know, they knew the, uh, when the Old Testament talked about when Messiah would come, he would be accompanied with signs, miracles, and wonders. Jesus said to his disciples that when I'm gone, you will do many more things than you've seen me do as far as signs, miracles, and wonders. And in the book of Acts, we have this history of them doing exactly that. Because whereas Jesus was one person, the Spirit of God in him, and the only those that were around him could see that, now you've got the Spirit of God in all of these individuals saying the truth to other people, and it's multiplied. It's multiplied. Verse 43, And fear came upon her, and so many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. They had all things in common. Sold their possessions and their goods. And there's reasons why they did it. Remember, these people that, that came from these journeys, they're staying behind. And they don't need money to buy food to take care of these people. And that's what they did. These home believers sold and divided them among all as any had need. Now verse 46 says, And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. We talk about many times, boy, we wish, you know, God would do some kind of movement like that amongst us. Uh, maybe in your lifetime, you've seen where there's been a great spiritual awakening, a, a revival, a, a, a thing where people are, are in the presence of God and, and God convicts them and they turn from their sin and place their faith in the Lord and God begins to do all these wonderful things through their life. And here's the thing. We aren't doing any of it. Today, the church isn't doing any of it. Not God's stuff. The Lord Jesus Christ is still doing it through us as we yield ourselves to Him. So what are the basic reasons why the church exists today? And that's what I want to talk to you about. There are five out of this passage of Scripture which serve as, as the foundation for all Christian churches as they began to be developed and as Paul would establish them everywhere he would go and uh, set up churches and elect people to, to serve as elders and leaders of those congregations. This is the model. We exist today, first of all, to celebrate God's presence. And we do that through worship. Now, in, I look at our bulletin this morning. I look at our order of service. And I see several wonderful things that are consistent with early things. And we see this whole idea of celebrating God's presence in worship. And I'm not just talking about um, when we all get together. It's really a thing. Worship is something that is private, you and God, and it's also corporately coming together as bodies of, of members of the body of Christ together to do it. Matthew 4, chapter 10. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, that the Father seeks worshipers, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. And Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so when we come together like today, we're coming together to worship the truth. The one true living God. Some of those elements of worship and expressions of worship, they would be singing, there's praying, there's giving, 
There's times of commitment, times of confession of sin, times of hearing the Word of God, uh, time of meditation. There's times of reliance on God, of self-denial and testifying. And I look at our, our order of service and I see many of those items. Many of those elements are right there, folks. There's singing. There's praying. There's going to be after the preaching, time of, of giving so that you know, you as a church can spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and function in this community. There's times of encouragement that we that we receive from talking, whether it's at the beginning or at the end, or whether it's just by going through the order of what we're experiencing today. There's times for making commitments to God. There's times on here about um, confession of our sin. It's this time where we we hear the word of God and then we hear the word of God on this side. Times of meditation. Well, these are all elements of worship, folks. So what you're doing here is right. Amen? That's right. That's what you should do. The only thing that might be different would be as if the attitude in which we have while we're doing these things were not right. We are here to worship the one true living God. That's, that's why we congregate together. And so the first thing is, is they were there and they were worshiping the Lord. And, and because they were worshiping the Lord, listen, they were breaking of bread. That, that has its symbol, excuse me, their symbolism. They were reminded, as Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that my body was broken for you and my blood was spilled for you. That's what they were doing. Every time they met, they were remembering that. And they were in prayer. Elements of worship. But there's a second thing, element of worship, and the reason why the church exists today. And that is to communicate God's word. That's evangelism. Whatever word you want to use it. Gospel sharing, uh, living out the gospel, making the gospel known. Whatever you want to say. It's telling others, not only by what we say, but telling others by the way we live our lives. That God loves them. That God has a place for them. That God has a purpose for them us in our lives, whether it's as small children or even whether it's as, as adults. We celebrated this morning in our church, um, our, our first item of worship was uh, there was a lady, an older lady, had accepted Jesus Christ and she was baptized this morning. After that we watched a, a video clip from Wednesday night where one of our teenagers, teenagers had been baptized. I was there for that. And I'm sitting in the congregation with other adults who, before going to our class, we want to witness that as well. And you know what? I counted 85 teenagers in the sanctuary. 85 teenagers. I'm glad I don't have to be there with them. But I mean, and I went, there was 100 kids in the back. Those sound good. But you know what? Here's the good thing is, is they're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're giving their lives to God. And there are people that are helping them be nurtured in their faith, learning what it means to trust God, how to pray, and how to walk with God. That's what's important. Now those folks that come on Wednesday nights, those teenagers and those children, Many of those come from other churches, small churches that can't provide some of those things, but those churches and those families, grandparents, they let them come there so that they can be in the Word of God and be amongst their peers. It's a good thing. I pastored small churches and I used to let my children do the same thing because we didn't have where we were at. But we found out there's always something to do. And listen, one thing I've found out, a lot of people like when they're being, they like being together. People like being together. Nobody really is mine. I'm sort of a loner. I like being with other people. I 
mean, I like being on the step, but I like being with other people too. I like being with other people. Telling others is by how we live and by what we say. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 uh, talks about that his intent, God's intent all along um, for his church was to manifold wisdom of God that it should be made known to all. I think about Romans. Back over in Romans chapter, and I'm going to read this to you because it's, it's an interesting uh, piece of, uh, of scripture. In Ephesians chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 10, verse 13 and 14. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, you know, shall be saved. That is the whosoever. Now the whosoever just isn't anybody off the street who's never heard the word of God. The whosoever are those who have heard truth and accept truth. That's the whosoever. Verse 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Stand, that's reasonable. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now this isn't talking about a preacher that stands behind the pulpit. This is talking about someone who foretells the good news of Jesus Christ. You'll be witnesses of me? He's talking about us. As we share the good news. Listen, if it was good enough for us, why wouldn't it be good enough for somebody else? And if somebody cared enough to share it with me, why wouldn't I want to share that with others? I have a 16-year-old grandson that lives with me. And uh, his sister, 17. And Caleb came to us. They were, they were not church. But there's something around about being around a godly influences. And it can work either way um, where somebody may want to have it. I prayed for them for months, you know, about coming to church. I didn't say anything. They knew I all wanted them to come, but I left that to them. And then one day, it just happened. Somebody from school who comes to church there, finally one of them asked them to go to church. You know, people that we know will come if we ask them. Believe it or not, that is true. They don't come because we don't ask. If we ask, yeah, likelihood of it is, is that they will come. They will come. And so he went. And then he came again. And then he came again. And he came again. And one day, you know, I got to talk to him about Jesus. And you know what he did? He gave his life to God. And now, I got to baptize him on a Wednesday night. But the great thing now is that I have this wonderful privilege of leading him discipling him in his life in Christ. The boy is hungry. I don't know that I can do it. <laughs> I don't know that I can do it. But he's hungry for Jesus. He's hungry for Jesus. And uh, I don't push things. I let it. I just do what I know God says to do and live before him. Um, hopefully he sees the good and not the bad and the ugly. Uh, hopefully I live as I need to be living before him. But there are reasons why we need to be about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. The first reason is because God loves people. He loves people. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says that the Lord is patient, not wanting any to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. Because God loves people. That's why we should share that love of God with others. Let everybody I talk to about Jesus <laughs> wants to follow Jesus. And I can't do anything about that except for live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And be ready to give an answer, as the scripture says, of that hope that is within you. We also need to do it because God commands us that we should reach out. Um, you know, it's our purpose for existing. To share the love of God that he has for us. Luke chapter 14 talks about it. We are to go out into, you know, the highways and the byways. Or the New Living Bible says to go out in the country and, and to urge anyone that you find to come in. 
so that my house may be full. You know what they're doing in Acts? That's what they're doing. They're, they've gone out. God's brought them together. They've gone out. They're sharing the truth. It is the Spirit of God that quickens the truth. And Jesus is building His church like He said He was going to do. And He is doing it today. We just may not see what... Because we try to judge ourselves by another church, by another faith, by another group of people. No, it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is what it's all about. And we need to share the good news by how we live and what we say because um, it's God's will. It's God's will. There's always been a witness for the Lord, even in the Old Testament. When the prophet thought that he was the only one, he said, huh, I got a bunch over here that have defiled himself and that are witnesses for me. He's always got the bread. But we also exist not only to celebrate God's presence and worship, not only to communicate God's word and evangelism, but we also exist as the body of Christ, his church in this world, in Lawrence County, in Warren Ridge today, to incorporate God's family in fellowship. The word fellowship that's used all throughout the book of Acts is the word koinonia, and it's a commonplace place kind of fellowship. It's, it's like two people just getting together in agreement and doing things together. It's caring for one another without being judgmental towards them. That's what they were doing. They had been forgiven and they were learning how to be forgiving towards himself and how to forgive other people. That's love. That's the uh, litmus test of love. And they continued, Acts 242 here said, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. First John 1 7 says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Well, we not only exist as the local body of believers in Warner Ridge, Arkansas, to celebrate God's presence through worship, and we should certainly invite people to come and be part of worship because it's about God. We communicate God's word by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. And we incorporate people into the family through fellowship. Through fellowship. But we also educate God's people, and that's discipleship. We teach them to observe all things whatsoever Jesus said I command you. Teach them to observe. Discipleship is helping believers grow in their commitment to God. There's a starting point. They hear the truth. The Spirit of God, at His time, quickens that truth, they understand that truth, challenges that truth, they say yes or they say no, their lives are changed from whatever decision they make. If they say yes, they're incorporated in the body, the body has a responsibility to nurture and to protect and to lead them to grow in their Christian walk in the Lord. You know why some churches are failing today? Because they're not really worshiping God. You know why some churches are failing today? They may have worship, may have great worship, but they're failing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know why some churches are failing today to live up to God's standard? It's because, you know, the pandemic, you know, it made us all not be together. We can worship on TV, we can eat have all that, we can, you know, we can, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Because there's a lot of fellowship. There are some people that feel like I'm just too old. There are some people that are young and just don't see the need of being together. Some people, some churches fail, folks, because uh, they fail to educate God's people through discipleship. We have a responsibility to each to nurture each other in the fear and admonition of the Lord as children 
and as we grow to continue to encourage one another. But there's a, a fifth reason out of this passage of Scripture. And by the way, you will see this pattern all through the book of Acts and the rest of the writings of the apostles in the New Testament. We exist to demonstrate God's love. We demonstrate God's love by ministering to one another. The word ministry is a word that just means to serve each other. God has gifted his church with the abilities that it needs to nurture and to take care of each other's needs. They sold their possessions, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet, and they took care of each other. And they continue to do that as church existed. That's been one of the, you know, one of the, the, the hard driving points in, in every congregation, or most congregations taking care of each other. The Bible says that now God has given us many kinds of special abilities or gifts. And there are different kinds of services to God. First Peter, I mean First Corinthians 12 talks about this and it also says that they were all together down, you know, form one body in Christ. Christ is the head. And each one of us are separate, yet we're all necessary to the body of Christ. If the guy shows up to preach and nobody's there, does that make sense? If you, if you plan to reach out and you don't share the plans with anybody else and you show up and nobody's there, you see what I'm saying? It's about people, and what we do with people shows the kind of love that we're growing to have towards God. I, I want to, I want to love God like Jesus loved me. I do, but I, I also see that it has everything to do with how I treat somebody else, how I respond towards somebody else, and what they're experiencing in their life. See, I remember the body of Christ is a minister, has a responsibility of serving each other, has a task, and that task is important regardless of what it is. Is every, every member in the body of Christ is a ten. It's not working to be a ten. We are. Every piece of the puzzle is important. One piece gone, the puzzle's not complete. We're all important to God. So this is the work that Christ left unfinished. That is the church, the establishment of his body here on earth to continue what he started while he was here. And that's what we need to be reminded of, I think, often. It's not about me. It's about what God wants to do. And maybe hopefully use it. And one guy said it this way it's finding where God's working and doing. Finding what God's doing and being part of it. And we have that opportunity, folks, every day. Every day. Because God's always doing something. Always. Sometimes being busy. Can be a chore. Can be a chore. Serve the Lord with gladness, what the scripture says. Amen. Serve the Lord. We've been called to serve. So where I left you today, and this may come back up again this week, this next Sunday may come back up, is that you know what Christ came to give us has been given to us. And we need to make the best use of it in this world, in Lord's camp. Let me pray for it. Father God, you're always so good. I mean, we just, and we know we, we can't ever measure up from our looking at things, but thank you that you've already taken care of all that. And we just pray that you just continue to give us opportunities to be where you're at, like the early church was. Bring people like you did at, at, at Pentecost. Bring folks together so 
there can be some way of sharing the Jesus that, that we love and serve. We know that it's your power that quickens the word of God and brings people to repentance. Your word tells us that the goodness of God leads men to repentance. So we pray that this will be so good to us, Lord, that it just keeps us on our knees. Help us, Lord, to turn away from what we want to do and just do what you want to do. In, with, for, and through us, God. In Jesus' name. Amen.